Okay, so you can find your way in your Bibles tonight to 2 Chronicles chapter 33 here after a, a couple of weeks of being off from the Bible study. Uh, we will wrap up 2 Chronicles tonight and then next week we'll head right into the book of Ezra. Remember that uh, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are all dealing with that time period in which the children of Israel uh, are going to be returning from captivity, knowing that they were carried away many years ago. And again, First and Second Chronicles written down for the day when they're returning and to, to restore unto the children of Israel, Israel, if you will. Uh, they were carried away captive to rebuild the, the walls of the city in Nehemiah's day, lay the foundation of the temple in Ezra's day, and we understand that as we come to this tonight, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 33, recording a time period in history in the days of which um, Hezekiah had been king, and now it says in Second Chronicles 33 verse 1 that Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Remember that Hezekiah had asked for more life. Uh, he was told that he was going to die, and it was that Manasseh was born in that last 15 years of his life. Now, has, uh, Manasseh comes to the throne, and you and I are need to, going to learn, uh, verse 2 says, But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. He raised up altars for the Baals and made wooden images, and he worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritists, he did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Now, as we enter into this time period in which uh, Hezekiah was one of the best kings of the southern kingdom of Judah and followed up by his son Manasseh, who was by far the worst uh, king. Now, in, in the recounting of the history, and the recounting of the, uh, really the evil day, in a time period for 55 years because of the wicked leadership of Manasseh, they had rejected God's ways and commands. And the, the phrase repeats in this, uh, in, in regards to the chronicler writing this down, that he had done evil, he did more evil, and then he provoked the children of Israel and seduced them to do, to do more evil than the nation's uh, whom they had destroyed when they came into the promised land. Now, God is not slack concerning his promises, but is long-suffering toward us, desiring that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. In this long-suffering and waiting and all this time period, God also has waited for the children of Israel. He has given them opportunity to turn, and it's now in Manasseh's day that in this, in this history, in this rejection of God's way and doing evil, like the heathen, the two, two phrases in there, uh, the witness of the Holy Spirit, that the people of God were doing as much evil, and now in this case, more evil than the nations that, were, that lived in that land. Again, remember the testimony was God gave children of Israel that land because of the evil and wickedness of those nations that lived in there. And now uh, the people of God in Manasseh's day look worse than the heathens. Now, it's important for you and I because now as, as Christians and church history and time periods and governments and, and that the church has gone out into the entire world and there's various governments and, and places and, and evil and wickedness and there's a, a rise of evil and then there's times where, where evil is on the decline, that the children of God, the righteous, still need to live in, in an evil day. Now, you'll, you'll recognize this, that really I, I would say that verse 8 is really the, the key point is that they're rejecting God's word. So where it says they were commanded and they, they would have been able to stay in the land had they obeyed the ordinances, kept the law, the statutes, 
But by this point, they are rejecting God's word and Manasseh is leading in that. Now, um, then the Lord spoke to Manasseh, verse 10, and his people, but they would not listen. Um, when it comes down to it, the people of God having done more evil than all the, than all, uh, of, the of the heathens and the, and the people around before they moved in there, and now it's in their, in their testimony that when God comes to them and he actually says you're, you're doing wicked and, he, and you're doing evil, they would not listen to the Lord their God. Helpful for you and I because we can study church history or we might, even with a bit of awareness, go back in the recent, recent history and watch the evil that is happening within the body of Christ and the rejection of God's word and different positions which historically were rejected as evil and wicked. I mean, you look at that list of what Manasseh was into, he was into every evil demonic activity, sorcery, witchcraft, and he even introduced um, really astrology, you know, the, the worship of the stars. He introduced that to the children of Israel. That, that was not there before. And it you and I would understand today that when the church rejects God's word and we reject God's ways, that the church has introduced all kinds of ideas and all kinds of worldly practices. And it's not strange today that you would look up on a church website and you would find that they are offering now yoga classes, which previously would have been really like, why would you introduce an Eastern practice into a Christian environment? And yet it's now become widespread, different practices concerning uh, um, Eastern prayer and meditation and the techniques of, of which formerly were, were considered godless have been not just introduced into the church, but the, ch the church is now exporting that out. And yes, we could very easily say we live in a day and an age in, a, in an evil environment. We might talk governments, but we might also then say there's a time and a place where we need to understand that even the church introduces evil practices, the idolatry that would be on the rise in different, in different areas. Now, will we listen to the Lord? See, th this is really what's before uh, Manasseh, and he will not listen. So the Lord, therefore the Lord, brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him in bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now remember, in, in Hezekiah's day, the king of Assyria came, but one angel in one night killed 185,000, and then the king of Assyria leaves them. But now the king of Assyria, because Manasseh has, has sold himself to do evil and wicked, God sends the king back, and they carry him off to Babylon. Verse 12, it says, Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the Lord God of his fathers, and prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. After this, he built a wall on the outside of the city of David, on the west side of Gihon in the valley, and as far as the entrance to the fish gate, and an enclosed Ophel, and he, and he raised it up to a very great height. Then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. He took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he cast them out of the city. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. Now, we, we get the accounting of in the affliction, when God lays a hold of him and puts him into to fetters and he afflicts him, that he humbles himself, he repents, and then he, he does return to, to Israel. And how do you know that this repentance took? Well, because when he got back into power as king, he made all the changes and all the reforms, and we read how he once again set up uh, to build security and make the people secure, and then he put away the foreign gods. And that's really the testimony, uh, which could have been uh, lost on us if we would miss this, that Manasseh did evil for many, many years, but upon that, he... Um, he turned, humbled himself and turned to the Lord towards the end of his life and no doubt um, had its effect upon the people. Now, the rest of the Acts of Manasseh, verse 18, his prayer to his God and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, indeed they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. Also his prayer and how God received his entreaty and all his sin and trespass and the sites where he built places and set up wooden images and carved images before he was humbled. Indeed, they are written among the sayings of Hosea. So Manasseh wrestled with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. Then his son Ammon reigned in his place. <coughs> so for, for us to realize that at any given point in time, 
There may be, may be a good portion of the church in this land or in this world and now with that, that there may be a turning away from the, the word of God. There may be turning away from the ways of God and there might even be practices that are introduced right into our midst and there might even be uh, times of correction and adjustment by leaders and that you and I need to see that through this all, there is a message for the children of Israel coming back in the days when they have to, be, have to restore what it is to follow God, and that we as church would understand what it is that, for us in our day and age, what we have, and uh, even through the days of evil, how we can walk with the Lord. Now, Ammon, um, Ammon was 22 years old when he became king and reigned two years in Jerusalem. This is the son of Manasseh here. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon sacrificed to the carved images with his father Manasseh had made and served them, and he did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. Then his servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. But the people of the land executed those who had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. So out of most of those 57 years was a reign of evil in the government. And Ammon had, had sought to do even more wickedness and evil, even though he saw what happened to his dad. He saw the affliction, he saw his dad humble himself, and yet he chose uh, to serve uh, all the, all the uh, idols and all the uh, wickedness. Now, 34, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem and did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. And in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and, and the incense altars which were above them he cut down, and the wooden images, the carved images, the molded images he broke in pieces, and made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, as far as Naphtali and all around with axes. When he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, he beat the car had beaten the carved images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now, to, to serve the Lord through the days of evil, and now we turn to the next king of Josiah, and really now what it is through the days of reform. Now, 300 years, uh, 300 years prior, by name, Josiah was named that he would come and defile all the, all the idolatry of the northern kingdom of Israel, and that's fulfilled. And yet we recognize that um, this also is not necessarily something for you and I um, uh, to be strangers unto. We, we can, again, study through church history, and you'll recognize that there, there have been, there's been evil practices that have been brought up in the church. And then there were days of reform in which there was a turning back to a former time or back to a former leader or, or following in the ways of something that had gone previously. And that's really what happens in Josiah's day. He, he goes back to follow David and seek the God of his father, David, and then recognizing that, that there should not be worshiping any other gods. And he went with a great reform. And we have times in church history of reform. Now, it's still not the answer, by the way, as we get into tonight's study. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Jehoahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. When they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites, who kept the doors, had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, from all the remnant of Israel, from all Judah and Benjamin, to which they had brought back to Jerusalem. Then they put it in the hand of the foreman, who had oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to workmen, who worked in the house of the Lord, to repair and restore the house. They, they gave it to the craftsmen and the builders, to buy hewn stone and timber for beams, and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully. Their overseers were Jahath and Obadiah, the Levites, the sons of Merai, and Zechariah, the son of Meshalem, and the sons of the Kohathites, to supervise. Others of the Levites, all of whom were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and were overseers of all who did the work of any kind 
of service, and some of the Levites were scribes and officers and gatekeepers. Now when they brought out the money that was, that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Now we pause there as we look at this time period uh, in history of which is leading right up until the end of the children of Israel being carried away captive. And yes, they had a wicked king in Manasseh and Ammon, and then under Josiah they have a time of reform. But understand this church, that as we come to this and, and place of, of trying to recover back to what we might in many times even recall uh, that you could watch the church try to hold fast to church tradition, try to hold fast to those things that have, that have been handed down and holding on to those things and, and even watching Josiah do the reforms and even to restore and rebuild the, the temple, uh, it's, it's a great work that he's undertaking, but when it comes down to it, uh, there's a sad statement that we ended with that the word of God, the book of the law, had been lost, had been buried under all the, all the false worship of the past, all the idolatry, all the, all the wickedness and the evil, and the word of God had been, had been lost, and they find it in the days here when uh, Hilkiah goes in and finds it, and it, I get the sense that it's literally the book of law of which Moses had, had written down, and no doubt, uh, when they recognize it, and Shaphan finds the book, of, or, or receives the book of the law, and uh, Shaphan then carries the book to the king in verse 16, Bringing the, word, uh, bringing the king word saying, all that was committed to your servants they are doing and they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered into the hand of the overseers of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book and Shaphan read it before the king. And then it, thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire the Lord for me, and for those who are left in Israel and Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. Now, really, if we, if we take a look at this, and I think this is a great place of understanding for us, you know, 2,000 years after the cross, roughly, and uh, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we've even experienced this in the last 20 years of Christianity here in North America, where there was just this great desire and this great push to go back to what was called ancient worship. And this idea that, that the church would go back to its roots. And, and you watch the, the introduction of the practices of, of trying to find out what it was to connect back with what the church was doing. And most of that really went back to the third century of what you would discover and then the, the use of candles and, and different experiential type of worship that, that all of a sudden was ushered into the church in this country. And you saw others, um, you know, different practices go back to particular writings or, or, or different teachers, different isms, if you will, and different denominations holding fast to their denomination or different uh, uh, waves of, of, of turning away from God's word. And when it comes down to this, and this is really tonight's title. When it comes down to it, when you, when you think of church and you think of what we have at any given point in time throughout history and what we hold to today, and it really is that which took place for them, and this is that title, is we have found the word of God. You know, and when it comes down to it, are we going to go back to, to an experience of church history? We're going to go back to something we heard about when we were little or, or some kind of tradition that you read about in a different book? Or does it come down to this, where when God's word is found... You, you would even say, up until this point in time, you say, man, Josiah is a great king. People are turning back to God. They're, they're, they're getting rid of idolatry, and, and they're doing really well. Yet, when God's word is found and it's read in the hearing of Josiah, immediately in the presence of, of having heard what God said and everything that was written down in God's word, he weeps when he realizes how wicked and evil they have been, how they haven't followed God's word. And this is a great thing for you and I to have that when we have found God's word, it is for reading, it is for understanding, it is for, for gaining all the insight into what God has revealed and what he said uh, would be happening. And even that prophetic element, you know, no doubt when they're reading here and, and they weep, probably a passage like Deuteronomy 28 through 30, which talked about the, the curses for disobedience and the blessings for obedience, or maybe Leviticus 18, where it said about the wickedness of the nations that were there before they came in. 
But that section of scripture that immediately, when having God's word and it's found and read and understood, he cries. It should be that very much that experience when you know that what you hold in your hands is not just, you know, a book that uh, the church got together and, and took a vote and, and by a narrow margin these, these books were chosen. No, this was preserved, the very word of God, that we could know God, that we have the word of God going forward, that we can read it in its entirety from Genesis to Revelation, and all that is in there is the word of God. And yes, by the way, when you're going to read some things, you're going to look in there and you're going to read and, like, and, and you are going to weep when you recognize how much of God's word has not been followed throughout history. And so we don't go back to an experience of, of what we call early church or, or ancient worship or any of those things. I've read through the book of Acts. I've read the letters to the churches. I've, I've read through the word of God and considered. And yes, they had problems in the early church like we do. And in many ways, you'll recognize that when you come to God's word and you understand the answers for life and godliness are in there, and it is to be read and to be understood, and it comes down to it, one, one clear statement is that, that there is a righteous judgment of God upon the children of Israel. And when, when he says to go inquire the Lord for me, he wants to know because he reads that because of their disobedience to God's word, God's wrath is going to be poured out. Now, when we come to this idea that God's word, the prophetic element of God's word, that you and I would read that which is yet to come that we wouldn't let that go by the wayside. The return of Christ, the rapture of the church, the, the thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth, the, the coming time period where, where there is going to be God's wrath poured out upon this Christ-rejecting world, that we hold fast to the word of God. Now is not the time to fall asleep. Now is not the time to, to, to feel good about ourselves in this, in this world. Now is the time to be awake and ready and watching and praying for the Lord's return. Now is the time to be ready and now is the time to be redeeming the time because the days are evil, to be going forth and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you understand and you read the newspapers and you, you read your Bible and with understanding you recognize Ezekiel 38 and 39, the, the prophecies of the nations that are going to gather against Israel, that's right around the corner. The, the fact that Israel is once again a nation since May 14th, 1948, that should cause your Bible understanding and having the word of God and that there, Israel is once again a nation, we should be so aware that the, the Lord's return is very near that it causes us to lay other things aside in our life because having found the word of God, there's things that, that we must do in our day and age. So as they go and inquire the Lord, because they had disobeyed, uh, so Hilkiah and those of the king uh, pointed in verse 22, they went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her to that effect. Then she answered them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. Coming wrath and coming judgment upon Israel. We also know that when we read your Bible, that today there's a coming wrath and judgment upon the Christ-rejecting world. Now, but as, as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me and tore your clothes <coughs> and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see the calamity which I will bring on this place and on its inhabitants. So they brought back word to the king. Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart. And, and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. So, so the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abomination from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel. 
and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God all his days. They did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. Now, that's the equivalent that when we have the word of God, and when he has the word of God, he himself reads it before the people that they might hear the words of the covenant. And when we have found the word of God, church, and, and give a great place in our time together, in, in our in our. Uh, gatherings as far as what we call church services, to give a great place to the study of God's word, the reading of God's word. And when you and I have this and understand that the word of God is to be shared out, that we would know what God's word says, that we might pass that on to all. And really, if you'll catch this, verse 31 and the whole thing, to obey what God has said in his word. And I can't underscore that enough in your personal life as you read the Bible and as you come to studies and, and you're coming to the word of God and you're reading and you're finding out that there's a particular way in which God wants you to order your life. And that's what we have in church. It's like, why do we do what we do? Because God's word has shown us this is how we are to, how we are to live. And when we have that and we, and we continue to hold fast to the word of God, to do those things that are written in it and the, the stuff that is in the scriptures that's why um, to read it and then to know what to do. And we'll find that this now results in Josiah's life taking on an even greater obedience. And that really should be for us as church that when we have God's word, we understand what it says and that it's for doing that then our lives take on a greater obedience to be um, uh, pleasing to the Lord. Chapter 35 says, Now Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem and they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their duties and encouraged them for the service of the house of the Lord. Then he said to the Levites, who taught all Israel, who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon the son of David, king of Israel, built. It shall no longer be a burden on your, sh on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people, Israel. So no doubt when they were worshiping all these other things in the temple, the priests would take out the ark and then now he's telling them, bring the ark back uh, to, the, to the house of the Lord. Prepare yourselves according to your father's houses, according to your divisions, following the written instruction of king David, king of Israel, and the written instruction of Solomon, his son. And stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the father's houses of your brethren, the lay people, and according to the division of the father's house to the Levites. So slaughter the Passover offerings, consecrate yourselves and prepare them for your brethren that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So you, you recognize that place of having the word of God and they start to keep the Passover and it's we need to follow what God has given in his word. Then Josiah gave the lay people lambs and young goats from the flock all for the Passover offerings all who were pre present to the number of 30,000 as well as 3,000 cattle. These were from the king's possessions and his leaders gave willingly to the people to the priests and to the Levites, Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jahiel, rulers of the house of God, gave to the priests for the Passover offerings 2,600 from the flock and 300 cattle. Also Kaniah, his brothers, Shemaiah, Nethanel, and Hashbiah, and Jael, and Jezebel, chiefs of the Levites, gave to the Levites for Passover offerings 5,000 from the flock and 500 cattle. So the service was prepared and the priests stood in their places and the Levites in their divisions according to the king's command. And they slaughtered the Passover offerings and the priests sprinkled the blood with their hands while the Levites skinned the animals. Then they removed the burnt offerings that they might give them to the divisions of the father's houses of the lay people to offer to the Lord. As it is written in the book of Moses, so they did with the cattle. They also roasted the Passover offerings with fire according to the ordinance. But the other holy offerings they boiled in pots and cauldrons and pans and divided them quickly among the lay people. Then afterward, they prepared portions for themselves for the priests because the priests, the sons of Aaron, were busy in offering burnt offerings and fat until night. Therefore, the Levites prepared portions for themselves and for the priests and the sons of Aaron. And the singers and the sons of Asaph were in their places according to the command of David, Asaph and Heman and, and Jedithan the king's seer, also the gatekeepers were at each gate. They did not have to leave their position because their brethren the Levites prepared portions for them. So all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover and, and to offer burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord according to the command of King Josiah. And the children of Israel who were present 
kept the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. There had been no Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet, and none of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as Josiah kept with, all, with the priests and the Levites, all Judah and Israel who were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, the Passover was kept. <coughs> now, as I, as I pause there and just reassure you that this is that place, that this Passover of all the other kings, none of the kings had kept it like he did. And we watched Hezekiah keep that when we looked at the study last time that Hezekiah kept it in the second month. And it was all done according to that which was written in God's word and that which was to be practiced. That when we come to this church with understanding, you know, for, for Ezra and Nehemiah, when they're gonna come back and they're going to rebuild the temple, they're gonna rebuild the city, they're gonna reestablish worship, and they're gonna go back to the word of God to know what to do. Likewise, church, when we come to this and, and when you recognize that throughout history, evil may have come in, other practices may have been entered in, but yet when we have the word of God, we can go back to the word of God and, and look and consider and say this is why we do what we do is because we found it in God's word. So very, very much a practical understanding of, of what, what was the early church into. When you read the book of Acts, what did they do? What were their practices? What was the love they had for one another? What was the, the serving? What was the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts? What did they have? And then what did, the, what did the apostles teach? What did Jesus teach? And we'd be able to take those things and, and have the word of God. That's why we live the way we live and why we must practice the way we practice because we have found the word of God. Now, uh, verse 20 says, after, the, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. But he sent messengers to him, saying, What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against the house which I, with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, refrain from meddling with, with God who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself so that he, might not, that he might fight with him and did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God, so he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah, and King said to his servants, Take me away, for I am severely wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his father, and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah." Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah, and to this day all the singing men and the singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel, and indeed they are written in the laments. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all his goodness according to what was written in the law of the Lord and the deeds from the first to last, indeed they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Now we find that Pharaoh Necho, and I think this happens sometimes in, in his zeal in which he destroyed all the all the uh, false worship, and then he has a king, a foreign king coming up, and, and immediately enters into the idea that he would withstand this king and not recognizing that God had a, had a different plan going with the king of Egypt. And he ends up dying over that, which he was never to get into. And I think it's very important that when you and I have the word of God, that we stick with the word of God and that we don't get into these different ventures that aren't ours to, and different battles for us to get into, to our own hurt, just because we can overtake someone or we can go out and withstand something does not mean that that's what God has for us as we would hold fast to do what God, uh, what was written in the, in the, the word of God. So you look at verse 26, you know, it's, uh, he, the rest of his acts of Josiah is goodness according to what was written in the law of the Lord and his deeds is that he really was one of those guys who led the children of Israel back to the word of God to do what God's word said. That's a great place to be at tonight, church, that not just when you come to Bible studies, but when you, you begin to organize your entire life because what was written in the word of God, that's why our marriages are that way. That's why, why our churches are that way. That's why we parent in the way that we do. That's why we interact with one another. That's why we work. That's why we serve. That's why we watch um, you know, in, in the body of Christ, uh, those that are called to different places in the body of Christ are raised up and we watch that God then builds his church Begin because that's what is written in the word of God. And what a great place tonight to have found the word of God. Now, as we close up Chronicles, we, we really have the, the accounting here of the end in chapter 36. Very effective. Very effective to, to those that are gonna come back and try to rebuild and understand why, they, why, why what happened in them happened. 
very helpful for you and I to come to these places in Scripture where we can understand why are things the way they are because they had rejected God's word after the days of Josiah. Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. Now the king of Egypt deposed him at Jerusalem, and he imposed on the land a tribute of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. Then the king of Egypt made Jehoahaz's brother Eliakim king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him off to Egypt. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against him and bound him in bronze fetters and carried him off to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried off some of the articles from the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in the, his temple at Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim, the abominations which he did, and what was found against him, indeed they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, then Jehoiachin his son reigned in his place. Now as we look at this, and in the days of Manasseh, you know, Isaiah was, was prophesying. In the days of Jehoiakim and Josiah, Jeremiah is prophesying. And it's, uh, we have all that accounting in the book of Jeremiah, how Jehoiakim resisted what God was, was telling him to do. And they had the word of God and they were no longer following the word of God. But in that day, they even had the prophet who was come along and saying, this is what God wants you to do. And they would not listen. And Jehoiakim was carried away captive. Now, Jehoiachin was eight years old when he became king and reigned in Jerusalem three months and 10 days. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. At the turn of the king, at the turn of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar summoned him and took him to Babylon with the costly articles from the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah, Jehoiakim's brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. Now, tonight we, we talk about having the word of God and we also see here that in that day and age as they had the word and then they had the word from the prophets, they heard from the mouth of the Lord and, and they were rebelling against God's um, revealed word. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear an oath by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. So you see their evil continues. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people in his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of the sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak, he gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and, and all his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And all those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Uh, just a, a brief accounting of why they ended up and, and carried away and in that day and age. Again, Chronicles written down for their return, but it leads up and, and all their wickedness and evil and everything where they would not turn, they would not follow the word of God, they would not turn and listen to the prophets that God indeed, finally, after all those years of long suffering, fulfilled his word that, that they would be judged. And then the time period given to Jeremiah that it would be 70 years, in the days of Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they were carried away captive. Um, Daniel, reading from Jeremiah, understands that it's going to be 70 years of captivity, all to fulfill the word of God. Now, with that today, when I say that Israel is once again a nation, is, is one of the miraculous things when it comes down to an understanding your Bible, that not only do they come back in that day and age, but they come back in our day and age. And when we come to this place of understanding, we're left with hope, 
as uh, the Chronicles is written and, and the hope to come back and restore and rebuild Jerusalem is there for them and God's word will be fulfilled and that you and I, the hope that we have today is not that, that this world is going to get better or that somehow the church is going to get better or that somehow everything around us is going to get better but our hope is that Christ is going to return and that he is going to restore uh, and he's going to rule and reign and that he's going to rapture the church out. There is, there is a hope that we'll spend eternity with him Here's the hope that's left for the Chronicles. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jerem might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says King Cyrus of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you all his people, May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So in that, that final word of hope, and then Ezra will pick up in the exact same spot, that God, even though he carried them away captive and he punished them for their disobedience, he made a way for them to come back. Now as we look at this tonight and we have the word of God and what we, what we hold fast to is what God gives in his word is for us for doing and understanding what is happening in, in our world in this day and age. And, and we might say, well, we live in days of Manasseh. If we took 55 years of evil and laid them over top in this country, uh, just the wickedness and the evil that has been introduced over the last 55 years and the practices and, and taking the word of God out of schools and, and, and now the word of God is taken out of, out of churches and all these practices that exist, that when we have the word of God and we found it and we hold fast to the word of God, that God will fulfill his word. Uh, <coughs> and for us as church to have the word of God and to read the word of God and to do what it says and to be ready when Jesus says that he is going to return and that, that um, his parables that half the, um, the virgins waiting for the bridegroom to return didn't have oil in their lamps, they weren't ready. That, that the church was exhorted over and over again to watch and pray for they do not know the hour that, the, that their, their master is going to return that we would be able to take all this and understanding and to be faithful to, to serve the Lord and love the Lord and to, to walk with the Lord in this day and age, that we would be ready for, for what is going to be fulfilled in God's word. It's a matter of timing. It's not a matter of, of if these things are gonna be fulfilled. It's a matter when God says, now, and, and that trumpet sounds and the shout of the, arch, um, the, uh, of the archangel and, and we'll meet the Lord in the air and we'll be with him forever. And when uh, the time comes to when, when the, the Antichrist is revealed and, and he sets up that false peace, that three and a half years with Israel, and that there's a, a seven year time period that Jesus referred to as tribulation, the last half of the great tribulation, talking about that abomination of desolation at the midway point, all these things are gonna come to pass. All these things are gonna happen upon this, this Christ rejecting world and we know that and we have that and we have this word to share out that really the, the message is, is not uh, people come to Christ so that they can, they can go in the rapture but it, it really is this, that you give your life to Christ Jesus and because of his cross you can be saved from sin and death. It really is that, that place to be saved for all of eternity and we know, we know that these things are coming and we know that this is going to happen, that lets us know that time is short and that we are to live our lives in a certain way. Not because there's reforms to be done or not because everything's wicked and evil around us, not because we don't like certain practices, but because we have the word of God and we take the word of God and say, I've read this in the word of God, that's why I live the way I live. That's why I go to church, that's why, that's why I spend this time, that's why I pray, that's why I believe what I believe because this is what's in God's 